Hi, JJ here again with The Art of Value. Welcome. Today I'm going to talk about investor and fund manager Terry Smith. He's written an article for the Financial Times called Why I Never Invest in Bank Shares. First I'm going to talk a little bit about who Terry Smith is in case you don't know and then I'm going to get into what he said. Okay, just quickly, Terry Smith runs a fund in the UK called Fundsmith. He's been investing for a long time. He used to be a top bank analyst, which is relevant to the, what he's talking about in this article. He also wrote a book recently called Investing for Growth, which I've read. It's a really good book. I really recommend it. I'm going to drop a link, a referral link in the description if you haven't read it already. It's much cheaper than a course, investing course, and you learn probably just as much. So now to the article. It's called Why I Never Invest in Bank Shares, Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse Collapses Prove My Point. He wrote this article published on 21st of March 2023. So very recent. He says, having spent the first decade of my career working in a bank and then becoming a top rated bank analyst, I find that people often express surprise that I never invest in bank shares. So what he means there by being a top analyst, he was the number one rated bank analyst in the Reuters Institutional Investor Surveys from 1984 to 89, it says at the bottom of the article. So he goes on, but I think it's precisely because I understand banks that I never invest in their shares. The recent events surrounding the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, SVB and Credit Suisse reinforce this stance. Why? He questions. If you're not up to date with what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, I've made a couple of videos on that. I'll link to a playlist at the end of this video on YouTube and put links in the description to that playlist if you want to catch up on that. So Terry Smith says, Firstly, I never invest in anything that requires leverage to make an adequate return. Banks have a small amount of equity to support their balance sheet. Here are the actual numbers for Nat Bank Group for 2022. So what he says is this, NatWest has £5 of shareholders equity to fund £100 of assets. It has gearing or leverage of 20 times. And that's not unusual for a bank to have 20 times leverage. This is what they do, they use leverage. If 10% of the £52 of loans in every £100 of assets assets prove to be bad, then the whole of the shareholders' equity is more than wiped out. So he's talking about the dangers of investing in something with that much leverage. He says, frankly, long before that happens, depositors are likely to spot the problem and panic and cause a run on the bank, as we saw in Silicon Valley Bank. Nor are these circumstances unimaginable. Author Nassim Taleb, in his book The Black Swan, points out that in the 1982 Latin American debt crisis, the large American banks lost all of their cumulative past earnings. In contrast, the average company in the S&P 500 index, which includes banks which distort the numbers, he says, has $26 billion of assets and $8.5 billion of equity. They are on average geared three times. So compared to banks 20 times, Falls in asset value are not their main risk, but their assets would have to fall by more than two-thirds in value to impact the value of their equity. Next, he says, despite the massive leverage and the risk which accompanies it, returns from the banking sector are inadequate. The average return on equity ROE in the S&P bank sector over the past five years is just 10.9%. This compares with the ROE of the S&P consumer staple sector over the same period of 17.9%. And he's quite keen on those kinds of companies. We'll see in a minute. I'm going to show you the companies that Fundsmith owns after this. These poor fundamental returns unsurprisingly translate into poor share price performance. So much for the theory that you need to take more risk to get higher returns. That's sort of a new investor fallacy that you have to take more risk to get higher returns. Value investors in particular disagree with that. It's more about understanding the company to get higher returns, not more risk. So he goes on, finally, surely there must be some good banks to invest in which are better than the average. That brings me on to another problem, systemic risk. Even if the bank you're invested in is well run, it can still be damaged or destroyed by a general panic in the sector. Of course, he's right there. He's referring to the financial crisis, which the banks were involved in. However, we must remember Warren Buffett, and he talks about Warren Buffett quite a lot in his book. He's somewhat critical of what Warren Buffett invests in sometimes. Buffett's very keen on banks. He understands banks. He's invested in the Bank of America. He's got a huge investment in Bank of America, and he's been invested in other banks. Sold Wells Fargo recently, but he clearly understands banks, and he's got the kind of money to 
almost bail banks out when they need it. So that's another perspective from Buffett, but he disagrees with Buffett there in terms of investing in banks, even though Terry Smith understands banks well. So two great investors, different opinions there. Next, he has an anecdote to illustrate his point, but I'm not going to go through that. It's about a local bank in Hong Kong when China took it over and a bank run developing. The point is that bank runs can develop and once they get going, they're hard to stop. And that has systemic risk in, for if you're an investor, which you don't want a bank run. As, as we've seen the Silicon Valley Bank in that video I made, they can happen very quickly. Just within, with overnight, a bank can collapse with a bank run, especially with social media. You could say that in Silicon Valley, the, the word of mouth was on steroids there, and it was said that $42 billion worth of money was want, wanting to be withdrawn sort of immediately. So the bank run happened and the bank collapsed very quickly. If you're getting value out of this episode so far, please remember to like on YouTube or on Rumble to give me that little dopamine hit and help spread it to more people so more people see it, thanks. So Terry Smith says, that's banking for you. Banks can be brought down by the actions of their peers. Look at what happened to some US regional banks in the wake of the SVB disaster. I've talked about that in previous videos as well. It's kind of a, they're trying to stop a domino effect to other regional banks like First Republic and other ones too. So they're trying to backstop depositors so that bank runs don't develop there in the US and regional banks. He says Lord Mervyn King, the former Bank of England governor, encapsulated this when he observed that it made no sense to start a run on a bank, but once one has started, you should join in. And people have said that about the Silicon Valley Bank, that really, uh, if you're not, depositors aren't going to get their money back, which was a risk. In the US, it's up to $250,000. And Silicon Valley Bank had a lot of depositors, startup companies, tech companies who had a lot more of that in the bank, so they stood to lose it all, although it did get backstopped in the end. That's the action that got taken. But it's possible that you wouldn't get your money back above that level. So people like Peter Thiel was advising his startup companies and his fund to go and pull their money out of the bank, and that, that's what kind of started the run. So he's saying, if there's a bank run, you want to be first in line. So Terry Smith says, that encompasses my long-standing reasons for avoiding bank shares, but another has emerged in recent years, fintech. What are the essential functions of a bank? To take deposits, make loans, and effect payments. All of these essential roles are now being supplanted by so-called fintechs. Bank loans are being replaced by peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms and credit funds. You don't need a bank for payments or deposits. You can get your salary paid straight into your MasterCard or Visa account, and they are far better at payment processing, for which you can also use your Apple or Android phone. So this is basically saying that fintech's providing a lot of alternatives, digital wallets and so forth. This is a criticism I've heard before of banks, the changing banks and fintech sector, and I do believe this myself too. You could say that there are our functions being taken over and the banks kind of aren't keeping up with that. Terry Smith says, technology is supplanting traditional banking. Have you noticed that your local bank branch has become a pizza express in which role, by the way, it makes more money? <laughs> In his fund and Fundsmith, we'll see that one of the companies he owns is Domino's, so he's being literal about that as well as making a joke. Not only that, but the banks are often handicapped by legacy systems which do not trouble new entrants, and at least until recently, fintech startups enjoyed a seemingly endless supply of funding with little or no requirement to show a profit. So he's talking about the Silicon Valley, there were fintechs where the VCs are funding it until it makes a profit, often to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. We've seen in the last 10 years or since the last financial crisis, there's been a lot of companies as they grow uh, blitz scaling, we could call it, with VCs funding hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to keep them going until they hopefully make a profit and have a huge market share. So he ends the article with this. As Paul Volcker, the infamous former chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, said the only innovation of any consequence by the banking sector in 20 years running up to the global financial crisis was the ATM. And we don't even need those anymore. So he's talking about digital wallets there. We can transfer our money with mobile phone, PayPal, and Square, the cash app, and others too, Venmo. There are so many ways that we can move money around and store money now, and even crypto. So we could say he didn't mention that, but that's another thing. So we could say that traditional banks 
may be losing business because of that in future. Well, he, he sees that as a risk anyway, definitely a risk for him to keep away from banks, even though he's an expert in banks. So in a sec, I'm gonna talk about what he does own. If he doesn't like banks, what does he invest in in his fund? We'll have a quick look at that. But what do you think of what he said? Do you agree with him about not investing in banks? Clearly we've got Warren Buffett who likes banks, understands banks, but and does invest in them heavily from time to time. Bank of America and American Express, which is partly a bank, and they've both done very well for him, but Terry Smith not liking banks at all, wanting to keep away for the reasons that he stated. So what does he invest in? Let's see. This is a list of Fundsmith's top holdings and also Smithson's companies are in this list too. They're all lumped together. This is through Ticker Terminal. So Novo Nordisk is the top holding with over 2.4 billion in value. Microsoft next, L'Oreal, then LVMH, Moet Hennessy, Louis Vuitton, Philip Morris International, Estee Lauder Companies, IDEX Laboratories, this is around a billion now, this is between 2.4 and down to a billion. Striker Corp, Automatic Data Processing, McCormick & Company, Waters Corp, PepsiCo, Visa, Diageo. So there's quite a few holdings, the list goes on. Metler Toledo International, Brown Foreman Corp, Nike, Coloplast, Adobe, Church & Dwight, Alphabet, Meta Platforms, familiar US tech names there, Unilever, Intercontinental Hotels Group, Amazon, Otis Worldwide, which is the lifts, the elevators, Sabre Corp, Fever Tree Drinks, smaller company in the UK, VeriSign, Domino's Pizza, there's that pizza brand, Fortnite, Massimo, and Rightmove PLC. Some of those are smaller ones and they're smaller holdings, down to 109 million Rightmove is there. So why are those companies? What have they got in common? I know from reading his book that he's got a kind of motto, very simple points. It's buy good companies, don't overpay, do nothing. And from the Fundsmith website, he's got this list that says high quality businesses that can sustain a high return on operating capital employed. It's very important. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger like that too. And so do I. Return on capital employed, very important. Businesses whose advantages are difficult to replicate. Businesses which do not require significant leverage to generate returns. Businesses with a high degree of certainty of growth from reinvestment of their cash flows at high rates of return. Businesses that are resilient to change, particularly technological innovation. Businesses whose valuation is considered by the company to be attractive. The company being his company, the fund. So he wants to get good companies, really good quality companies that have already won at a good price. His book's called Investing for Growth, but he does have that Warren Buffett-like value philosophy as well. He wants to get them at a good price, so getting good companies at a good price, not overpaying and then doing nothing, so holding them for a long time. In case you're wondering how he's performed, how his fund, Fundsmith, has performed, it has since inception got 496%, and that's annualized to 15.6%, whereas equities, the index, and he uses the MSCI World Index, has 270%, which is annualized to 11.2. So he's beating the market. He has been described as the UK Warren Buffett, although that's that phrase is slung around a lot, depending on who's doing well over the last few years. But he has done well over time. So if you got this far in the episode, maybe consider subscribing if you're not already on YouTube, Spotify Video, Rumble, or on your favorite podcast app. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching or listening.